let me tell you something. When Otto Frank actually first read his diary, his daughter's diary, he realized that even though he had lived with her for 24 seven over the last two years, he never really knew the depths of his daughter. And how many of us really know what goes on inside the minds of our teenage children? Welcome to Zestful Aging, where I talk with fascinating, talented, and influential guests who reflect on the adventures and challenges of aging and who are living their lives with vibrance and purpose. I'm your host, Nicole Christina, psychotherapist, writer, and Zestful Ager. And if you like this podcast, you'll love my companion course, Zestful Aging, Simple and Sustainable Habits for Health and Longevity. You'll have access to what I've learned from being a psychotherapist for 30 years and the latest research on what habits really matter and contribute to vibrant aging. Find out more at NicoleChristina.com. Last week, we spoke with John Leyland, New York Times columnist and author of Happiness is a Choice You Make. It is a poignant, heartwarming interview where he tells some secrets about his relationships with some of the oldest of the old interviewees that he spoke with. It is really, really lovely. I hope that you get a chance to listen to it. And next week, we have Catherine Switzer, who is the first woman to run the Boston Marathon. Well, I have my Jack Russell Terrier Sparky beside me, my coffee in my hand, so let's begin. We have a really special guest for you today. Jillian Walnes Perry is the co-founder and honorary vice president of the Anne Frank Trust UK, which she set up in 1990 with the family and friends of Mr. Otto Frank, who was Anne Frank's father. She served as the trust chief executive until her retirement in 2016. And after her retirement, she wrote The Legacy of Anne Frank, which is a book on the surprising global legacy of Anne Frank, which was published in 2018. And she now lectures on this topic in the UK, here in the US, and she also travels across the oceans on cruise ships, bringing the message of Anne Frank's legacy. Welcome to the show, Jillian. Thank you, Nicole. I've been looking forward to this. As have I. Um, I am, I'm, I've been so fascinated by the Anne Frank story since I was in middle school and it's just stayed with me and I think I shared with you one of the things that is on high on my bucket list is to go to Amsterdam and and go to the Anne Frank house and I guess what I wanted to start with is this question of the universal appeal of Anne Frank what what do you make of that uh, it's, it's something that I, I'm asked a lot. And, well, it's basically, I think, because she is a young person that all young people can relate to at that time of their life because they're all going through the same bodily changes, emotional upheavals that Anne Frank was going through herself in that transition from being a child. And actually, when she starts writing her diary... She is indeed a child, and uh, she writes in a little bit of a a childish way, beautifully, but in a childish way. But you can see over those terrible two years that they had to spend in really claustrophobic hiding. Can you imagine not being able Mm. to go out for over two years and just stuck with adults that are driving you mad? And And having to be quiet and whisper all the time, all the time, oh. and um, it, it just that, that intensity and knowing that, that any day you could be discovered and she knew the reality of what would happen if they were discovered. But also, Nicole, she's actually transitioning from a child into an, uh, an adolescent and taking on all those feelings of, I'm going to be growing up, I'm going to have to be taking on the responsibility of becoming an adult. So you can see through those two years how her her whole writing is changing, even actually the style of her writing matures. 
But let me tell you something. When Otto Frank actually first read his diary, his daughter's diary, he realized that even though he had lived with her for 24-7 over the last two years, he never really knew the depths of his daughter. Mm -hmm. And how many of us really know what goes on inside the minds of our teenage children. Mm -hmm. So there are so many ways that people can get into this story. Of course, there's the poignancy of, of what happened to her, you know, this young life full of promise that was cut mm -hmm. short through hatred and persecution. And also there are so many sort of what ifs, what might have been. The Frank family um, were actually arrested very close to um, the end of for example, they went to Bergen. They they went to Auschwitz first. They were actually on the very last transport out of the Netherlands to Auschwitz. How it was. I read that in your book. It was the last. It was the last train. Exactly. So there's the poignancy of that. Had they been betrayed and arrested, perhaps one month later, and Frank would have survived. Also, um, the fact that the Anne and her sister were then moved on to Bergen-Belsen, which was probably even more difficult to survive in that last winter because Bergen-Belsen was actually neglected by the, the Germans. They had almost abandoned it and the, the inmates to their fate. There was no clean water, there was very little food. And under, under those circumstances, when you're malnourished, uh, mm -hmm. deadly diseases like typhus, which Anne and Margot died of, are very easy to take hold and kill the populate, kill the the inmates. So, ironically, if they hadn't been sent to on from uh, Auschwitz to Bergen-Belsen by that time, the gas chambers were being blown up because the Nazis wanted to, wanted to hide oh, all their evidence. So I they see. could have just got through, their, oh, like their father gosh. got through, just mm -hmm. got through Auschwitz. He almost died. Um, if it, if the liberation by the Russians had been perhaps two weeks later, he probably would have died and we wouldn't have had the diary. Um, and then, of course, the, the most poignant thing is that uh, Anne and Margot believed that their father had died in those last mm -hmm. days when they lay dying of hunger and mm -hmm. disease in Bergen-Belsen. They actually believed their father had died. They knew their mother had died in Auschwitz, they'd heard but they thought their father was, no no way would he survive. He was too elderly. Um, had they, they had known, no hope. They had, they no, had hope. no hope. Had they known that as they lay dying, Otto Frank was already liberated and on his oh. way back to Amsterdam yes. to wait for news of his daughters. So um, there are so many, words. there's so much poignancy in this story. And of course, what this young girl would have become because she almost took responsibility for changing the world. She wanted to make the world a better place for other mm -hmm. people. And despite mm -hmm. what she was going through, she still had this incredible moral responsibility. And mm -hmm. she wrote some incredible things in one of her stories. You know, she wrote stories as well as her diary. She let her imagination fly out of the window. She, um, <laughs> she wrote stories, they all had a moral, a moral framework. She, she was telling people how to live their lives better. And uh, I think also the fact that Otto Frank was a very keen amateur photographer and he yes. took a lot of wonderful photographs of his mm. two daughters. And so we have those. And so on the, both counts, from her writing, we know what it felt like to be the victim of persecution. And also these beautiful photographs, we see Anne growing up and the life that she had before the Nazi invasion of the Netherlands. She saw this fun life. She traveled, went to the seaside, had lots of friends right. and had parties. And, and we see her and we read her words. And so she really speaks to generation after generation of young people. And we get to know her in all these ways. We see her in her flowery dress. We see her grow up. We see her as a real person. And you make that point in your book that she's not this ideal, you know, young woman. She was angry. She <laughs> would get a little, uh, I don't know, teenagery about yep. uh, different friends. And she wasn't a perfect 
person. I think that that makes her so human. She wasn't uh-huh. perfect. She she was uh, uh, the way she described the other adults that were in that also in that unfortunate situation yes. of hiding. The way not she, always generous. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's why, actually, when the diary was first published by a Roman Catholic publisher in 1947, um, they took out quite a bit of the diary. The, the first publication was only two thirds of what she actually wrote. Nowadays, when you buy the Anne Frank's diary, you get the full picture, you get the full diary. But it, it, things were removed. One third of that diary was removed for two reasons. Firstly, as you say, she wasn't very generous and she wasn't very kind about the other adults. So Otto wanted to preserve the memory of the other adults in hiding who had died the most terrible deaths. Um, And also the publisher felt that what Anne wrote about was highly unsuitable for people in 1947 (laughs) to read. Uh, But of course, now it's all put back. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like... You know her, Jillian? I mean, what's your relationship like with the memory of Anne Frank? I do feel I, I know a lot about her. Um, I never met her, but I met many people who met her, um, one of whom is uh, the, one of my co-founders of the Trust, Eva Schloss, who is the, she's currently the president of the organization. I'm the vice president, and I've spent 30 years with Eva, working with her very closely, and she describes Anne uh, so vividly, and you'll read about that in, in the book. And um, so through those people, sadly, I, I, I never met Otto Frank, and I always say when I come and speak, he is the reason that I'm standing on this stage in front of you, because it was his vision, his belief that... Mm-hmm. Um, education and getting to young people at the right age, the impressionable age, can make society better. He, despite everything, Nicole, that had happened to him and the destruction of his family, he still believed in the power of education. Um, So I've also met many people that were inspired by Otto Frank. Do you know something? When I first started the Trust, a few years into it, um, one of the last interviews he gave on the television was to a BBC program in, in the UK, a very popular children's program called Blue Peter. This was 1976, and it was just around the time that, um, uh, not well, not long after America had had their Civil Rights Act, and in Britain we had had our Race Relations Act. So uh, an understanding of racism was starting to filter into the agenda, but not really totally. So he went on television, probably for the first time, as a white man, he sat there and described the destruction of his family, what had happened to his family because of the horrors of racism and racial prejudice. And when I was starting the trust, I was receiving calls from teachers, not one, not even two, but several, who told me that they had gone into the profession of teaching because they had seen Otto Frank being interviewed on that television program and it had been so inspirational for them. Mm -hmm. So I feel that I've, through that engagement, I have touched Otto Frank, even though sadly I never met him, and and through the people that knew Anne Frank and even uh, people that I've met that were Holocaust survivors in Bergen-Belsen at the same time as Anne and Margot, and one woman who recently died in London last year, she and her mother had actually tended to the Frank girls in Bergen-Belsen in their last days. Mm-hmm. So through these people and, and, and also, of course, through Neep Peace, I had the great privilege of spending time in the 1990s and early 2000s with Meep. Now, Meep was Otto's mm-hmm. office administrator, and mm-hmm. she was one of the helpers. And these helpers, Otto Frank's staff, they risk their lives, not just for a day or for a week, Mm. but for two whole years Mm. helping Mm. those eight people, eight people in hiding. And I spent a lot of time with me. I even visited her in her apartment in Amsterdam. She showed me things that Anne Frank had given her (laughs) as gifts. Mm. And um, it was, you know, and she showed me things that Anne had written. I even actually had the most memorable, probably one of the most memorable nights of my life was attending the 1996 Academy Awards in Hollywood um, with Meep, walking along that red carpet with Meep. 
And um, it was because a documentary that I had commissioned in 1994 to mark the 50th anniversary of Anne Frank's death and the end of World War II was nominated for an Oscar. And we attended the ceremony together. And um, sure enough, it won. Um, people, and it, uh, well, it, tell me the name. It was called Anne Frank Remembered. It oh. was a two-hour documentary. And actually, when I speak around the US now, very often they show the film as well. And I speak about the film, how it came about, and um, the, the themes of the film, talk a lot about Meep, about spending that night with Meep. And um, so, yes, it, 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 uh, I've had some very, very memorable times with Meep, taking her to the BBC to do a recording. And we walked along the corridors. And uh, she said, Gillian, do you realize this was our lifeline during the war, the BBC, which they listened to clandestinely. Mm -hmm. So in those ways, I feel that I have touched Anne Frank. And then sometimes when I lecture, when I give a talk, um, people say to me, I feel I've touched Anne Frank just through listening to you speak. She's been an incredible influence on your life. Yes. Well, no, well, Nicole, not just my life. I'm almost the conduit. Um, she, she, I have seen for myself the influence that she has had on young people all over the world. And that is one of the premises of my book, this astonishing legacy around the world. And that, that's through <laughs> the traveling exhibition that was created by the Anne Frank House way back in 1985. First came to Britain in 86, and I first got involved in 1988 with it, and <laughs> have never stopped being involved since. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Anne Frank House, my colleagues there in the international department, have taken this exhibit all over the world, and really to some very surprising countries that have just come through turmoil, through, through seismic times. And I'm talking about places like um, uh, post-communist Russia, uh, in 1990, you know, one of the first cultural projects to go to Moscow after the doors started easing open was the Anne Frank exhibition. Um, and places like uh, Argentina and Chile, just immediately after those dictatorships, those terrible dictatorships, bringing people back together. Uh, Post-civil war in Sri Lanka, the Anne Frank exhibition mm -hmm. went to the places that were most affected and got young people talking about together about their experiences. I worked for a lot of the time in um, Northern Ireland through the 1990s, before the Good Friday Agreement, and um, it was one of the only projects that would actually bring Protestant and Catholic kids together to work oh on goodness. Anne Frank. And in fact, one Catholic um, and Protestant school for the first time ever joined together to produce a cross-community newspaper called Anne's Legacy because of Anne oh Frank. My goodness. So oh I my have been goodness. incredibly privileged to see all this in action and someone had to write it down. I mean, there were these incredible stories from all around mm -hmm. the world, mm -hmm. stories of, of wonderful educators, of fabulous human rights activists that were so brave in their own countries. And I was hearing all these stories over the course of 30 years from my colleagues in the Anne Frank House in their international department and my colleagues here in America in the Anne Frank Center for Mutual Respect. And no one had actually put it on paper. There have been so many books about Anne Frank and movies and documentaries, including the one, you know, that won the Oscar. But no one had actually written this story about how learning about her has affected the lives of young people all over the world. And also, you mentioned populations that might be surprising. Talk about the prisons, the high security, <laughs> maximum security prisons in the UK. Mm, yes, I, and I know that there has been some work done in, in the US as well, um, and in Germany. Um, yes, this all started for us in way back in 2002, when um, we received a call from a, um, a regional um, coordinator of prisons in the south of England. And they had had some, diff some problems with uh, uh, racism in the prisons. There'd recently been a murder of a young, a young boy who was in prison just for petty, petty theft. And um, he was Asian. And he was put into a cell with a known racist. 
Uh, not a good idea. And literally the morning that he was due to be released, he was beaten up and murdered by the, his racist uh, cellmate. And so she contacted us and said, look, we, I've, I've seen your Anne Frank exhibit myself personally, and I think this would be perfect to go into prisons. So um, we worked with one of our advisors who was very well connected in prisons, Nick, and um, we started out in uh, Reading Prison, Reading Prison, the famous prison that uh, Oscar Wilde spent time in. And, mm. um, and the rest is history, Nicole, because some 17 years later, we are still going into prisons. And what we do is um, we train the prisoners to actually be our docents. And it gives them a feeling of great responsibility when they see the content of um, what's in the exhibition. Mm. And really gets them opening up. We take a, uh, a range of workshops in, gets them opening up about all kinds of issues affecting their lives and particularly um, racist, r racism issues, uh, their own attitudes towards others. And that can be the, 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 the white prisoners, the black prisoners and the Muslim prisoners. But in one innovation that we've done, which people find very surprising, is that we take Holocaust survivors into prisons. Mm -hmm. Now, when we first mooted that idea with Holocaust survivors, you can imagine they weren't particularly keen um, oh. to go into um, a secure environment. Mm -hmm. You know, people who've come out barbed of the camps, wire. particularly yes. with the barbed wires mm -hmm. and the dogs and everything. But we found that once we started taking survivors into prisons, they wanted to do it more and more. And so we, as much as we can now, because as you probably realize, the survivors are getting fairly elderly and we're losing them each year. We're losing more and more of our wonderful survivors. Um, but uh, they, they do it and it's absolutely incredible. And what we do is we have, we bring them in on the last day of the program, the two week program in a prison. And they give out certificates to the prisoners for their work as, as docents, as Anne Frank docents. And you can imagine some of these young men and women have never had certificates for anything in their lives. Oh, oh, and, oh. Uh, and we go to the, the, the youth offenders institutions as well to get them young. And it's, it's been very powerful. It's been a very powerful program. And prison governors who go around, you know, move from prison to prison, one of the first things they will do if they start working in a new prison will be to be the Anne Frank, bring the Anne Frank program. And what is the message that the prisoners are, are leaving with? What, what do they get from this? Well, first of all, the fact that the Anne Frank Trust and other Anne Frank organizations have given them the responsibility of being an Anne Frank educator. We have trusted them. We've given them a special T-shirt that says Anne Frank mm -hmm. Guide, and which they, they wear long after we, we've left the prison. <laughs> they wear with pride. Um, and also we give them an engagement with the Holocaust story, with the Holocaust history. And also the responsibility we say to them, we are now, you have had the incredible um, privilege of meeting a Holocaust survivor. Many people out of prison in society have never had that privilege. You've had that privilege. You now have a responsibility that we are giving you to tell to tell this story. And the survivors themselves, mm -hmm. the way they describe their experience of being in prison, they were there to die. But prisoners are actually uh, given the opportunities in prison to be educated, to learn, to learn a career, to, to, to have a future career. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe not so much the mm -hmm. hardcore long time prisoners, but um, perhaps if we've got first time young offenders, then they're given opportunities to, um, to, to learn vocations, to improve their education. So that it's, it's very powerful, Nicole, when this message comes from a Holocaust survivor. And you know, it's I've I've listened to these talks for an hour. Now, prisoners may not have the greatest attention span in many cases, but um, you listen, you are in the room with a group of prisoners, maybe up to 50 prisoners listening to a survivor. You can hear a pin drop on that floor mm -hmm. because they are so engaged. And so, so, so attentive. There's something about having, you know, Eva Schloss come a, a little petite 
elderly woman, right, five foot two, coming yes. in with a little handbag and her cardigan to come <laughs> yes. into a maximum security prison. Something about we're all joined here. I mean, there's, we, you know, the suffering, the, there's some kind of connection of two very unlikely people. Yes, yes. And, and Eva actually goes in time and time again. Each year she goes back to a very high security prison in London and they absolutely, absolutely love her. And you know what? Um, she had spoken in one prison and I was there in South London and um, very high security. And a few weeks later, it was coming up to Christmas time and I got a, an envelope marked from this particular prison and I opened it it was a check it, it, it was 50 pounds in cash and it was a gift it was a donation from one of these high security prison prisoners who had heard Eva speak and he had saved up his pocket money which he earns from his work um, in the prison and he saved it up to make a donation to the Anne Frank Trust now 50 pounds was oh. a lot of pocket money to save up in a prison mm. And sure. he had been so moved and affected by Eva that he wanted to do that. So I'm thinking about your development as a woman and and how this has been for you in terms of hearing about the darkest aspects of humanity, the ugliest stories imaginable, and also the incredible incredible positivity and the hope and the beauty that comes out of that. You know, how how has that been for you in terms of balancing those two extremes <laughs> as you go yeah. through your life? Yes. Well, I, I suppose in a way it's a dichotomy, but I feel that um, and sometimes I feel you know, I'm having this incredible life, meeting these wonderful people, traveling around um, to these amazing places to talk about, speak about Anne Frank. And, you know, sometimes when I'm lying in bed at night, I think, you know, the guilt comes and you think, how can I be having this life on the back of Anne Frank's suffering and the suffering mm -hmm. of millions? How can I be having this? But mm -hmm. I suppose in a way, it, it's the fact that I'm telling the story and it's the ripples that it sends out, that I'm telling the story to a certain number of people, and um, but they're sending out the ripples and the programs that we have developed for schools. I'm not just talking about in the UK, but um, with my colleagues in the Anne Frank Center for Mutual Respect here in the United States, these incredible pr programs that we're doing. And how, and those ripples are not just short term, because I mentioned to you earlier about the peer docents that we use in the prisons. Well, we're using the peer docent method throughout the world and using, when we go into schools, when we go into communities, we are using the young people themselves, the people who are the age that Anne was writing her diary. Those become our educators. And this is what we're doing in schools. And as I'm speaking around the United States, I'm everywhere I go, people say, we want to do this. We want to do this in our middle school or our high school. We want to create these young people that are potential future leaders. And I'm not just talking about the privileged areas, Nicole. I'm talking about the areas that are very underserved. Um, we, we are aiming to work in some of the really tough areas of the United States, bringing these programs where we create these these new community leaders for the next generation, giving them the responsibility of becoming Anne Frank educators by bringing an exhibit to their school and creating mm -hmm. them as our educators. And you know something that some of the um, these peer docents that I've spoken to around the UK have said, you know, something we never realized would happen is that by becoming educators ourselves, being given the responsibility of telling our peers about the Anne Frank story through the exhibit, um, we have got a greater respect for our teachers because we understand the challenges that our teachers face when every day when they're trying to get us to listen <laughs> and trying to communicate to us. So there are so many. Empathy. Exactly. There are so many side byproducts of doing this, these programs where we create the, the 
peer educators and whether it's the children in a township in South Africa that have become peer educators or in a slum school in a favela in uh, Sao Paulo in Brazil where I was actually there and saw these little educators of 11 and 12 years old take mm -hmm. the Dutch foreign minister around the Anne Frank exhibit and educate him about Europe oh, between the wars. Um, this is giving young people a feeling of responsibility and particularly, as I mentioned, those underserved areas, a feeling of hope, a feeling of aspiration. Mm -hmm. I can become something because the Anne Frank Center or the Anne Frank Trust or the Anne Frank House has believed in me. And so this is the other premise of the book, is the power of peer education. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, it's it's so profound. I mean, uh, reading your book, and I, it's so well researched and the details of, you know, um, you know, where the where her diary ended up and how it was sort of thrown on the on the ground and mm -hmm. all of the details. Yes. And that is and that was just research on your part and in interviews? How did you get that level of specificity? Um, you remember that uh, um, I mentioned that I spent time with Meep and Meep was the very person who bravely went up and broke the lock and rescued the diary. So um, she relayed things to me. Eva Schloss relayed things to me. Many Holocaust survivors relayed things to me. But it was a wonderful pro project in a way because um, I, it, it's almost a helicopter tour of the thir last 30 years of the history of the world through the prism of Anne Frank and education about her. So it's, it's, if people like history want to know about history, that, that they, they will see the context of where the exhibition was going in these countries around the world, uh, the recent situations in those countries. Um, and also I, I interviewed people by Skype. Thank you, Skype, because Skype helped me to speak to people in China, in Hong Kong, um, in Brazil, in, in Argentina, uh, South Africa, all over the world. I spent a year uh, writing it up, writing from my memories as well, um, these sto incredible stories, and but also interviewing people from all over the world. And it was very exciting. And um, yes, you it's been- You were totally been... immersed, totally immersed yes. in her life and the story around her. How would your life have been different, Jillian, had you not adopted this massive project? I probably still would have been in some human rights capacity because um, prior to uh, getting involved with the Anne Frank, <laughs> with Anne Frank, um, I was very involved in the campaign for Soviet Jewry in the United, in um, the USSR. So I was very active there. I was the chairman of our very active campaign for seven years, trying to get um, the Soviet Union to open its doors to those people, the, the Jewish population that desperately, desperately wanted to get out and, and follow their own religion. So I was very, very involved in that. And I think had Mr. Gorbachev maybe not come into power um, in the mid 1980s and started opening those doors, and by the sort of late 1980s, I was feeling at a little bit of a loss. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and uh, that's when uh, my very good friend, uh, David Suttendorp, whose father was a friend of Otto Frank's, and he was very involved in the campaign, and he contacted me and said he'd heard about this amazing exhibition that had just come to. Britain, could I help him bring it to our town on the south coast? And I said, oh, David, I'd love to do that. And that's how it happened. And then I mm -hmm. took myself on a plane to Amsterdam and met the director of the Anne Frank House. Hi, Zestful Agers. I'll be attending the International Federation of Aging's 15th Global Conference on Aging in November of 2020. And if you're interested in improving your understanding of age-friendly environments, debating solutions to address inequalities, confronting the reality of ageism, and delving into what it means to enable the functional ability of an older person, head over to 
IFA2020.org to find out more. There's an early bird special on until the end of the year. So take advantage and join me in Niagara Falls. I'll see you there. This was, this was my first experience of writing a book. So it was, it was fun. I've written a lot over my career because I've written, for example, uh, blog posts for the Huffington Post and I've written um, op-eds for various newspapers and uh, written programs for schools, etc. But I'd never written a book before. And people say to me, what was it like writing a book? And I say, well, it was basically writing my, my life. And I was so enthused because I was writing about I, w- I was honouring the work of incredible people around the world and honouring the bravery of uh, the helpers and other people whose lives had taken the most amazing path. For example, um, Audrey Hepburn, how she connected to Anne Frank and her life, which was incredible. And Nelson Mandela, of course, um, who was so inspired by, by Anne Frank. And also I had very great, wonderful help in-house because my husband uh, was an editor. And uh, albeit in a different language, he was an Israeli editor. And so even though English was his second language, he did a phenomenal job in doing the first edit of the book. And so even though the book was actually a third more than the publishers had originally asked for, when I submitted it, they said, um, we're not going to take out any words at all because it's been so well written and so well edited. And I thought, oh my goodness, this is just amazing. And I was so pleased because I didn't want any of my colleagues, any of the people I'd written about to be lost. So mm-hmm. I was really thrilled mm-hmm. with that. Oh, it was just, it, it, you know, your many people's lives work and contribution and your life's work. Really summarizing, it was... 28 years something like that yes it was in t- yes in total it was about 28 year, almost 30 years because i first got involved in 1988 and the book mm-hmm. was written between 2016 and 2017 when it was submitted uh, so yes it was exactly 28 years it's a long time mm-hmm. how has it been for you um and the efforts of of your friends and colleagues to be witnessing what's happening now in the United States with the uptick of of racism um yeah and paint. and 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 other hate speech and violence well, how 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 do you work with that how do you process that it's extremely painful um funnily enough uh the Anne Frank Center held its gala dinner um, in June, and I was the MC, and I had the great privilege of meeting Rabbi Jeffrey Myers um, f- from the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, who came, mm-hmm. as well as the Imam from the uh, Linwood Mosque in New Zealand, and mm-hmm. they were brothers in arms, um, and they got on the stage together. We presented them with, um, uh, an award and um, an interfaith award, and also with the um, pastor from the uh, Baptist Evangelical Church, the African Church in, uh, uh, in North Carolina that yes. uh, suffered the terrible atrocity four years ago. So these, these three people are now brothers in arms, and um, they have seen for themselves on their own communities what hatred can lead to. And look, we do what we can. Um, we, we, we cannot change the, the world and, and some of its evils. But by getting to young people at an impressionable age and making them see through and frank what it actually feels like to be born a human being but become the victim of irrational persecution, this is very much the message that we work with in a non-political way. But You're humanizing in, the experience. It's not theoretical. It's not abstract. You're saying this is exactly what happens. And what it feels like. And what it feels like from the inside. And that's, you know, going back to the beauty of Anne's words, that she railed against humanity. And 
just this last few days ago, we um, marked the 75th anniversary of the very last words in her diary. And those very last words were, um, I turned myself in and out um, because she was, she was battling against the two sides, the contradictory sides of her personality. And um, with the good, the good Anne on the inside and the bad Anne on the outside. But if only I could, have, I, I want to see the person I could become, I could become if there weren't any other people in the world. And those were her last words. So her very last words, even though uh, over that summer, that last summer that they were in hiding, there was hope because they could see the Allies advancing after D-Day and they were so hopeful that they were going to be liberated soon, but it wasn't to be. But uh, so poignant, Nicole, that her very last words were this, these words about if only there were no other people in the world. Um, and that's what it's, and that's what we have to say now. We are doing what we can to make the world better and to, to get young people to understand that we are all different. And whether we look different, we sound different, we act differently, we follow different religions, we like different music, we follow different football teams, we are all different. And wouldn't it be a boring, dull old world if we were all clones? <laughs> and there was, wasn't this diversity. And, and you know, let, let's just value the fact that we live in a very multifaceted world but don't hate people because they're different. Mm -hmm. Find out mm -hmm. about them. Maybe you can learn something that will impact on your own life and make your own life better. Julie, it is now a good time to read some more of Anne's words. Um, I haven't actually got Anne's words with me. I've got my own words mm -hmm. with me. <laughs> oh, yes. Please. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, shall I go back to, uh, I'll go back to Anne receiving the note back, notebook, the little red check notebook for her mm, 13th yes. birthday. And um, it wasn't a complete surprise. She'd actually seen it in a bookstore around the corner from the apartment where they lived in South Amsterdam. And she was with her dad. And like kids do when it's coming up to Christmas or their birthdays, they do rather drop a few hints about the things they want. And she rather fancied this red check notebook. Now, the reason I think that it most attracted her to it was the fact that it had a lock on the front. And what 13-year-old girl doesn't want a lock on, oh, on a notebook absolutely. to keep it away from prying parents? Um, so I'm going to take up the story that she's actually received the notebook for her 13th birthday. Anne started writing in her notebook on the day she received it. Her first words were, I hope I'll be able to confide everything in you, as I've never been able to confide in anyone and I hope you'll be a great source of comfort and support. She had no idea on that day that in three weeks' time the diary was about to indeed become a vital source of comfort and support. She goes on to describe her birthday party and all the other gifts she received, and over the next few days she shares her privately held views about her school friends. On this matter she doesn't hold back, using adjectives such as stuck-up, sneaky and vulgar for some of her unfortunate targets. By the 20th of June, Anne has given her new paper confidant the name Kitty, after one of the characters created by her favourite author. Kitty is to become her friend, a surprising confession from a girl who says she has about 30 friends and a throng of boy admirers who can't keep their eyes off me. But with her human friends, she feels the talk is superficial and about ordinary, everyday things. Kitty will be her true friend. Paper will be her intimate confidant. And anyway, no one is ever going to read it. Three weeks after Anne had started writing her diary, on the afternoon of Sunday the 5th of July, the doorbell on the Frank family's apartment unexpectedly rang. It was a postman delivering the dreaded notice for 16-year-old Margot to report at midnight for transportation to a work camp. According to the notice, Margot would be permitted to take a number of specified items in a single suitcase, which had to have first and last name, date of birth and the word Holland written on it. In a foreboding of the true fate of the deportees, this was explained to be important because the owner's suitcase would be sent by a separate train. 
the hindsight of history gives us a grim insight into these bureaucratic instructions. By this time, not only Auschwitz, but Belgets and Chelmno concentration camps were fully operational in carrying out the extermination of Jews. The very next day, early on the morning of the 6th of July, Otto, Edith and Anne left their Maveda plane home together and trudged in the pouring rain across the city to the Prinzengracht offices of Mr. Frank's business, Opecta and Co. They were each wearing several layers of clothing and carrying one satchel, plus another bag laden with essential items. The city was still dark and people were scuttling about to get out of the downpour, so no one would have taken much notice of the sodden group of people who were leaving their home for good. Having escorted Margot, Meep Hees, Otto Frank's administrator, had already arrived by bicycle at the Prinzengraft office to help with the moving in. To reach to the, stair to reach the stairs to the hiding place involved slipping through a door that had been carefully concealed by a strategically placed wooden bookcase. The bookcase had been filled with the normal office paraphernalia of document folders, so as not to arouse any suspicion from Mr. Frank's office workers. Even to this day, all visitors to Anne Frank's hiding place access it by stepping behind this bookcase. You read that so beautifully. Thank mm. you. Do we know who betrayed the people in uh, Anne Frank and her um, people in hiding? Is it an office worker? We don't know, but um, in my book there is a chapter who betrayed the Frank family. Mm. And my conclusion is there have been many theory, many different theories, but my conclusion is that we will never know for sure. It's too late to verify anything because all the actors are long dead. Um, there is one theory that I think carries more weight. I don't want to go into it now. People will have to read it in my book. Um, I understood that there was an FBI, a f retired FBI agent from America who had been commissioned by, I'm not sure if it was the Dutch government or the Anne Frank House, to actually use contemporary modern technology to look into um, who could possibly have been the um, perpetrator of the betrayal. Uh, he was supposed to publish his uh, findings on the 4th of August, uh, which, is the, which was Sunday, and that was the um, 75th anniversary of the arrest. But I haven't just heard anything. Just last week. So just, just last Sunday week. Too. Yes, oh. just last oh. Sunday. Um, and But I haven't read or heard anything. So I don't know quite what's happened there. But I do believe uh, that one theory carries more weight than others. And I, I also believe that to actually verify that theory may be way too late. I see. I see. And I guess ultimately it doesn't really matter. No, no. Jillian, how can people help? I, I think we have a lot of listeners very deeply moved by this story and your work. And they may be wondering, you know, how can I contribute to your effort? Well, um, we have various wonderful organizations set up. I understand that you operate in... Uh, this is heard in over a hundred countries, which is fantastic. And um, the work of the Anne Frank House covers many of those countries, I'm sure. The work of the Anne Frank Trust in the UK covers um, the whole of the UK. And mm -hmm. we are a registered charity there and have wonderful activities and events. Uh, and of course, in the United States, we have the Anne Frank Center for Mutual Respect, for which I act as the uh, Outreach Ambassador, and I'm very proud to do so because they do wonderful programs as well. If you uh, know of a school, of a community that would love this kind of work, particularly the peer education program coming into mm. a school, um, mm -hmm. or you want to uh, act as a volunteer, or you want to help the Anne Frank Center raise money for their cause to take this work, this work which is so much needed, as you say, so much mm. needed in these in these times. Um, to uh, support the centre or to help uh, support bringing 
a program to your community, please do get in touch. Anne Frank Center in um, in in New York. That's AnneFrank.com. Very easy mm-hmm. to get onto their website, AnneFrank.com. Okay. And also, please buy my book. Yes. <laughs> um, my book, my book um, is uh, published by Casemate, but also available on Amazon.com and BarnesandNoble.com. Mm-hmm. And um, it, you don't have to read it from cover to cover straight away. It's not a detective story. Um, if you want to learn about Latin America, or you want to learn about Eastern Europe, or you want to learn about Audrey Hepburn, or Nelson Mandela, or Meet Peace, or all these amazing people, you can read it chapter mm-hmm. by chapter, dip into it. Um, so, and, the, uh, and the book again is The Legacy of Anne Frank. I just legacy, wanted to repeat. Yes. The Legacy of Anne Frank. Um, the content is a, a tranche of amazing, unforgettable people you'll never forget. Written by myself, edited by Elon Perry, my husband, <laughs> published <laughs> um, by Pen and Sword in the UK, Casemate Publishers in the US. And um, it's really a homage to some pretty amazing people you'll never forget Mm -hmm. well I so appreciate you speaking with me today and and carrying this message of hope to a, a world that that sorely needs it right now yes absolutely absolutely thank you so much Thank you so much for joining us on Zestful Aging. If you like the podcast, please share it with some of your friends. I love to hear from my listeners. Send me an email at nicolechristina.com. In this phase of our lives, we're more aware that our time is precious, and we certainly don't want to waste it taking care of stuff that we no longer need, left over from a life that we are no longer living. We know we would feel better with less clutter and more open space, but we don't know how to get there. If this sounds familiar, I'd love you to check out the online course I've developed with professional organizer and designer, Carrie Luteran. This course is different than others you may have tried because we give you clear steps to deal with the clutter and tools to help you face the overwhelm and feelings that come up when you're going through your clutter. It's practical and realistic, and the lessons are short and punchy and very manageable, but it has the power to change your life. We all deserve to live in a peaceful home without the chaos of too much stuff. Find out more at NicoleChristina.com. Next week, we have Katherine Switzer, who is the first woman to run the Boston Marathon. She was a college student at the time, and then she ran it again at 70 years old. She is a true advocate for girls, and I think you're really going to enjoy this. So see you then. <music>